There are now confirmed instances of human-to-human -human transmission. There's no question that China's bold approach. This a fresh chapter is unfolding in China. As the year 2023 dawns, the vast nation of 1.4 billion is charting a new course for an optimized COVID response, following a long, hard-fought battle. On January the 8th, China eased COVID restrictions on international flights, dropping quarantine for inbound travelers. The country has also downgraded the severity of its COVID management from Class A to Class B. This comes after more than three years of persistent efforts to protect people's lives and the country's socio-economic vitality. It all began in Wuhan, capital city of central China's Hubei province. Three years ago, Wuhan was the first in China to take on the invisible killer. Beijing quickly responded, by sending a working group and an expert team to Wuhan to guide the local response and conduct on-site investigations. In just over a week, a second team of experts rushed to Wuhan to continue the field investigation. Ten days later, a third team of experts was dispatched. There are now confirmed instances of human-to-human -human transmission. To contain the virus and to save lives, China made a swift but tough decision to protect his people. On January 23rd, Wuhan went into a lockdown ahead of the Lunar New Year. Citywide public transport was suspended. The city's airports, highways, and waterways were also closed. An effort to stop the lethal virus from further spreading across the country. At the time, the number of Wuhan's daily confirmed cases stood at 70. We have to strictly control the sources of infection, the infected and those who come in contact with them. Wuhan's lockdown soon dominated the world headlines. Growing concern as the toll from that deadly coronavirus now grows. The Western mainstream media had been quick to criticize China. Some public health experts argue the lockdown would have little effect on the course of the pandemic. Others, however, find it necessary. Human to human contact. One of the most important interventions in the event of an epidemic is to control the movement of people. And I think China has taken the right steps in responding to the epidemic. Within hours after Wuhan's lockdown, the central government decided to start an immediate nationwide mobilization. The first group of 150 medical workers arrived. They would eventually become a part of the 42,000 health professionals deployed to Hubei province. We've come to help the patients. We want to assure them that we can help them, that we're all fighting this together. No one backed down. Yet the city's health system was buckling under the strain as the infection surged. On January the 24th, the construction of the Huashinshan makeshift hospital began. With record-breaking speed, the 1,000-bed hospital was built in 10 days. Soon, another makeshift hospital, Leishinshan, began construction. On the first day of the Lunar New Year in 2020, Chinese President Xi Jinping chaired a meeting of the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee. He stressed that the country's top priority was to save people's lives, and the most important task 
was epidemic prevention and control. In Wuhan, action plans were rolled out on early detection, case reporting, quarantine, and treatment. The focus was on four groups of people. Suspected cases, confirmed cases, febrile patients who might be carriers, and close contacts. Severe cases were treated by the best doctors and critical supplies were pulled to save lives at all costs. Citywide testing was conducted. Stadiums and exhibition centers were transformed into 16 temporary fever clinics capable of admitting all mild cases. The entire nation rallied behind Wuhan. Holidays were cut short. Factories on a medical supply chain were running at full speed to produce masks, protective suits, and medical equipment. By mid-February, Hubei province received over 300,000 N95 medical masks per day, up from 35,000 per day in late January. To ensure the supply of daily necessities, the Wuhan municipal government pooled resources, organized group buying, and provided direct deliveries to residents under lockdown. The measures worked. The epidemic was curtailed. In Wuhan, daily confirmed cases plunged from a peak of over 13,000 to 615 in just over a week. The unprecedented move also bought valuable time for other parts of China and the world to fight the virus. Although there were outbreaks in other Chinese cities, they learned from Wuhan's experience and was able to keep COVID at bay by mass testing and a rigorous contact tracing. After 76 days of combating the virus, on April the 8th, Wuhan reopened. Normal life started to resume for the city of 11 million. Over the past 70 days, I was very grateful to people from all over the country that came to help. Wuhan is now slowly going back to work, and everyone is full of energy. I hope it will get better in the future. I'm really touched. Those who came to Wuhan for assistance spared no effort. It is not easy to have today's results. On April 26, the last hospitalized COVID-19 patient in Wuhan was discharged. Many more provinces downgraded emergency response levels and resumed business operations. On March the 18th, for the first time, no new cases were reported in the Chinese mainland. Despite being accused of authoritarian and draconian by some, leading experts found that the lockdowns had proven to be extremely effective. That um, there's no question that China's bold approach to the rapid spread of this new respiratory pathogen has changed the course of what was a rapidly escalating and, and continues to be deadly epidemic. A study published on Science Magazine found that without the Wuhan lockdown, 744,000 infections would have been reported by day 50 outside the city. In reality, however, the number was capped at 29,839. In other words, there were 96% fewer cases due in large part to the early lockdown. Wuhan showed the world that a timely, and decisive intervention is a necessary and effective way to contain the virus. In fact, China was not the only country that imposed lockdowns. In Italy, a nationwide lockdown was imposed on March the 8th. Nine days later, France declared a nearly two-month nationwide lockdown. The move was followed by New Zealand, the UK, and several other Western countries. An initial victory was secured, but the battle against the COVID was far from over. The country needed more time to learn about the virus and develop life-saving vaccines. 
Beijing had made it clear that while balancing pandemic control and economic growth, safeguarding people's lives and health was at a core of China's COVID response. We must put people and their lives above all else. The battle against COVID-19 is won for people and by people. In April 2020, the Chinese government rolled out the strategy of regular epidemic prevention and control. The main task was to prevent imported cases and local rebounds. The measures included quarantine for inbound arrivals, stricter inspections of imported cold chain products, early COVID testing and treatment, tracing of close contacts, and temporary lockdowns of targeted areas. In a following month, outbreaks were limited to small clusters, and life had largely returned to normal. The authorities in China have taken, uh, uh, you know, had a very strong um, approach to suppressing transmission, very low death rates, very low hospitalization rates, uh, and in a situation where society and the economy could continue to function pretty much well through the pandemic. Chinese scientists were racing against time to develop vaccines. According to experts, they're key to protecting the most vulnerable. In March 2020, vaccines made by Chinese company CanSino was the first to be approved for clinical trials. China's vaccine campaign started with targeted groups of people in mid-December 2020, and then expanded to a national scale. By March 27, 2021, over 100 million jabs were administered. Nearly a month later, that number doubled. The time taken for every 10 million shots was shortened to only five days, and 2 billion jabs were administered by late August 2021. New challenges had emerged in the second half of 2020, as the world grappled with the spread of the virus's more contagious but less deadly variants. Some began to question the effectiveness of vaccines against the new strains, but experts believe that vaccines still remain an effective protection. The results show that vaccines have a clear effect on curbing post-infection transmission and preventing severe illnesses and death. This still holds true even now amid the spread of COVID-19 variants such as Delta. Among the variants, Delta posed the biggest threat. First found in India in October 2020, it spread to over 100 countries in less than a year, according to the WHO. In July of 2021, a cluster of Delta cases were also detected in China. To contain this highly transmissible variant, Chinese authorities quickly adjusted their response measures. In August 2021, the dynamic zero-COVID policy was introduced, with saving lives as the highest priority. Under this strategy, swift actions were taken in a more targeted way after outbreaks were detected. They included mass testing and early treatment. Apart from these, three risk levels were assigned to different areas and COVID management was carried out accordingly. COVID risk levels used to be determined at the level of province, but now it's determined at the level of city, county, and even community. This way, we are managing COVID in a more precise manner, thereby improving the efficiency and effectiveness of relevant COVID measures. As more countries chose to live with COVID, China's approach was met with skepticism. Health officials in China, however, believed that this was the best feasible strategy for the country. China is a country with a massive population, unbalanced regional development, and insufficient medical resources. If the virus is allowed to spread freely, it will inevitably cause large-scale infections in a short time in turn leading to a significant spike in severe cases and even deaths. Not to mention, it will put an exceedingly overwhelming strain on medical resources. Vulnerable people will also be severely at risk. 
I think China's epidemic prevention and control has been very effective compared to many other countries. The death rate directly caused by COVID-19 is very high in many countries, but it's very, very low in China and even none in some places. This is very important. People's lives and property are important. In 2021, more than 30 clusters of infections were put under control. The Wall Street Journal said other nations could learn from China's dynamic zero-COVID policy as it helped China to suppress infections with less disruption to life. Only two deaths from COVID-19 were recorded in 2021. China achieved a steady rise in its average life expectancy in 2020 and 2021, while U.S. life expectancy had dropped to its lowest in more than two decades. Then comes the Omicron. The highly transmissible variant was first detected in South Africa in November 2021. It quickly swept across the world. A Japanese research show it was four times more transmissible than the Delta variant. China's financial hub of Shanghai and transportation hub of Zhengzhou were hit hard by Omicron in 2022. China's dynamic zero-COVID policy had once again come under fire in light of this new development. Some disagreed. They had a zero-COVID policy, a similar zero-COVID policy in New Zealand, and uh, New Zealand's a member of the Five Eyes. We didn't hear the United States ranting about that. So there's something of a, of a double standard. China's dynamic COVID zero uh, created uh, the closed-loop manufacturing. It, it protected workers. And it powered, uh, it provided uh, a lot of the, the, the goods uh, that were necessary for uh, people to survive. The situation on the ground meant decisions could not be taken lightly. From our experience in the past month and my management of this temporary hospital, I believe we must continue to use the dynamic zero COVID approach. Shanghai has rich medical resources, but the medical system has been burdened. That clearly shows why the dynamic zero-COVID approach is essential. If we abandon our strategy, our society will not be able to bear the rise in infections. When asked whether the cost was too high to continue with the dynamic zero-COVID policy, health officials explained what went into the consideration. Under the right circumstances, for example, when we have high vaccination rates, especially among vulnerable groups like the elderly, well-prepared medical resources, quarantine beds, healthcare supplies, emergency response mechanisms and so on across different regions, also effective medications that can be used widely, a milder virus without further undesirable mutations, and acceptable mortality rates. By harnessing the time window created by our dynamic zero-COVID policy, we will surely overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. Health professionals also pointed out the clear advantage of China's approach. One possible advantage of the dynamic zero-COVID policy is that you may see fewer cases of long COVID in China. Um, this might be one of the advantages, not just in terms of protecting people, but in terms of protecting your workforce and then, of course, your economy. By constantly optimizing its pandemic response, China was able to prevent large-scale outbreaks for quite a long time. Experts said China achieved good balance between epidemic control and economic growth. China was the only major economy in the world to achieve positive growth in 2020. Its economic figures in the following two years also showed positive signs. The country's GDP in 2021 was 8.4 percent more than that of 2020, and the number in 2022 also saw a 3 percent year-on-year rise. After combating COVID for three years, China was ready to move on to the next stage in its fight against the virus. In 2022, the new, highly transmissible Omicron variant started taking hold in China. Beijing quickly responded by rolling out targeted strategies and optimized the policies.
Twenty adjusted policies were first introduced in November. We proposed 20 COVID response policies based on the implementation on the latest version of the prevention and control protocols and have conducted in-depth study validated by experts. The new measures can significantly solve some of the problems encountered in the epidemic response in different places. The optimized COVID response included shorter quarantines and dropping monitoring secondary COVID contacts. Health officials said these could help better allocate medical resources to those needed the most and strike a better balance between pandemic control and economic growth. Then in early December, 10 new measures were adopted. They included easing movement restrictions and reducing the scope and frequency of mass PCR testing. And at the end of the month, China announced to downgrade its COVID management from Class A to Class B and to relax the entry and exit restrictions starting from January the 8th. Officials said the adjustment was based on a weakened strain of COVID-19 and enhanced immunity among the population. The pathogenicity of the Omicron variant is weak now. We think it's a good time to make some adjustments to our strategies. Evidence seen by the WHO and China both showed that the Omicron variant was causing milder symptoms than previous variants. Omicron is infecting the upper part of the body. Severe pneumonia is rare. 99% of patients can recover in about a week. By mid-November 2022, more than 90% of the Chinese population had been fully vaccinated, making China one of the world's most vaccinated countries. The immunization of our population is improving significantly. In particular, the vaccination rate among the elderly has reached a certain level. According to the National Health Commission, by the end of 2022, more than 80 percent of elderly people aged 60 and above had been fully vaccinated. Still, some have questioned the timing of China's move to relax COVID restrictions. The winter months in the Northern Hemisphere, this is when acute respiratory viruses are most prevalent. I, I thought that perhaps um, waiting until March or April until the weather warms up might have been a, a better time. But Chinese officials said the time for easing its COVID rules was based on a comprehensive assessment of vaccination rate and its effectiveness. If we ease the measures half a year later, the effectiveness of antibodies among the elderly will decrease. But if we had made the time half a year before, it would not have been a good time either. The overall vaccination rate for the elderly was relatively low at that time. And many Chinese said they look forward to the policy optimization. I'm confident for the future. The country has optimized these policies in the past three years. They are for the good of the people and the society. In the past month, we can see the country has been giving priority to the vulnerable groups of people, for instance, the elderly, children, and people with other diseases. The medical devices, medicine supplies, medical emergency hotline 120, ICU, etc. respond quickly and are allocated pretty well. The 78-year-old man had just been sent to the West China Hospital of Sichuan University from the neighboring Doyang City. He had severe COVID symptoms, coupled with underlying health conditions. The elderly was given an emergency oxygen therapy and transferred to the intensive care unit for continued treatment. After easing pandemic control measures, the surge of COVID patients had put the health system under increasing pressure. Fever clinics were overcrowded and medical staff had to work day and night to save lives. We require all hospitals to open fever clinics to meet the needs of patients with fever as much as possible. Tens of thousands of fever clinics have been opened in hospitals and community health centers. Many PCR testing booths 
were turned into makeshift fever clinics. Online healthcare and tier diagnoses and treatment systems had also helped relieve the pressure. In addition, the production of fever and cold medicine was up fourfold. Health officials said the priority was to allocate the limited medical resources to people in need. We asked the hospitals to coordinate all bed resources, equipment, and labor force all together. Despite the pressure, medical workers said they had amassed extensive experience in the past three years and were better prepared. During that time in Wuhan, we really didn't understand the virus. There were many severe cases, and many people suffered from respiratory failure. All of them had to be on ventilators and the ECMO. The ratio was very high. Now in Beijing, the difficulties in clinical treatment are much less than in Wuhan. We don't have so much pressure, and the proportion of patients going into the ICU is low. On January the 8th, China officially relaxes border control. Inbound and outbound flight restrictions are being lifted. Freight services were restored, and border entries reopened for international travelers. It's much more convenient now, so、uh, yeah, we're really happy now that we do not have these restrictions anymore. During the Spring Festival holiday, more than 200 million trips were made across China. The mass population flow had posed a serious task for medical systems, but the latest data from CDC showed that the peak of infected number has already passed. The daily infections and the COVID-related death have seen a downward trend. However, with an increasing risk of the new XBB subvariants, China's battle with COVID is far from ending. The COVID-19 pandemic is now entering a new phase. 仍是吃劲儿的时候，大家都在坚韧不拔努力，曙光就在前头。Chinese economy recovers steadily. Many believe that a reopening will also help revitalize the global economy. China is expected to contribute more、uh, to global growth this year than it has last year.、Um, on the demand side, that will be important. It will basically create. A stronger global demand.、Um, you know, I'm overseeing countries in the region and、uh, in Asia, and many of these countries. For for many of these countries, China is already the largest uh, uh, trading partner. It's also、uh, in places like Cambodia and Laos、uh, and elsewhere an important source of tourism. And these countries are eagerly awaiting、uh, the return of、uh, Chinese tourists,、uh, hopefully later in the year, as, as travel restrictions、uh, have been have been eased. I think that. Uh, China, being the second biggest economy in the world, is going to add impetus to the global supply chain, which is desperate for、uh, a boost after the pandemic and particularly the worldwide、uh, gradual recession that we are witnessing. So this is、uh, good for the people of、uh, China. It's good for the world economy. And I think, particularly,、uh, it would be incomplete if I don't mention the Belt and Road、uh, for the BRI countries for connectivity, because、uh, the Global South had particularly very much benefited from the Belt and Road Initiative. The hustle and bustle has returned. Long overdue family reunions, a spring festival filled with joy, with COVID shrinking quickly in our rearview mirror. China is ready to return to normalcy and to embrace the post-pandemic world.